At Expono, one of the most talked about rooms, at least from the people I talked with, was the Morel audio room. Now, morel has been making drive units forever, but I guess that they've recently gotten into making home audio speakers. I've been using Morel drive units since like 2008, and I actually currently have Morel speakers in my car audio system. Now, I walked into this room, I saw these floor standing speakers standing there, and I thought, those are some nice looking speakers. And I'll be honest with you, I just figured you're probably looking at $5,000 to $10,000 per pair, just based on the finish alone and the fact that we're at Expona. I demo the speakers very briefly, and, and listen, when somebody tells you about their experience and they try to go full bore into their experience at a audio trade show, most of the time you can just go ahead and tune out because these rooms aren't really set up for a proper demo. You're lucky if you get the prom seat and you're even more lucky if there's not a lot of people around the room talking and milling about, and it's gonna disturb your sense of getting a good quality demo. But having said that, I listened to these briefly and I thought, hey, that's not bad, there's nice bass. I mean, they don't sound horrible, and that's a good start for a trade show demo. But when I started talking to the reps there and realized that they're $2,000 per pair, I thought, holy crap, that's really impressive to have those looks, that good of sound, for 2,000 bucks per pair. Now, after that, I talked to more people and ultimately I said, I've got to get these, these speakers in to, to review myself. So I reached out to Morel and the speakers that I'm reviewing came from them direct from Axpona. So if you are at Axpona, the speakers I'm reviewing right now are the speakers that you heard in that room from Axpona. Let's start off with some specs and just get that out of the way real fast. This is a two and a half way design that uses three drive units. If you don't know what Two and a half way means, let's start with the basic. A two way design is typically a midwoofer and a tweeter. Two way, it's a crossover, two components, two ways of networking that crossover. A three way design is gonna have a midwoofer, a mid range, and a tweeter. And that network, you're gonna have wires coming into the crossover and you're gonna have three sets of wires coming out. Now, a two and a half way is kind of in the middle. Instead of having just a dedicated mid range, what it does is it takes two drivers and it splits up the signal going to those. In this particular case, the Bottom midwoofer is crossed over at about, I think 250 Hertz, but you guys can double check me. And the woofer above that goes from low frequency up to about 2.2 kilohertz. So there's a wide range that the top midwoofer covers, but that bottom midwoofer only covers low frequency to about 250 Hertz. Then the tweeter comes in at 2.2 K. The woofers are a six inch woofer with what I wanna note a three inch voice coil. Now, Morel and Don Audio both typically have large voice coil drive units and that, at least in my experience, does actually translate to improved power handling. Maybe not improved sensitivity, but you can turn the volume up louder and get more output before distortion really starts to set in. And if you're curious what these midwoofers look like, here you go. They actually had these sitting out for demo and I'm just gonna show them to you right now. And hopefully from this, you can get a decent idea that the voice coil is about the size of the magnet. Now, most times voice coils might be an inch, maybe two inches for a standard midwoofer. And I've burned up many voice coils in my lifetime. Luckily, I haven't burned up a Don Audio or a Morel voice coil. And I do attribute that to just them having a larger voice coil. And if you're curious what the tweeter looks like, here you go. Just to add, I'm actually having to go back and make this later. Um, <clears throat> a couple of my patrons and some of you have asked when I posted some teaser photos of the speaker, if this is the same speaker that Parts Express sells in kit form, which is known as the Solstice, and it was designed by uh, the late Jeff Bagby. It is not the same speaker. Uh, Jeff's speaker, the Solstice, is a two-way design, and this particular speaker is a two-and-a-half-way design. The Solstice is a transmission line. This speaker is a ported design. And then the Solstice uses a different tweeter for sure, it's, a, it's not just a different model, it's actually different physical dimensions. I did an impedance sweep on the woofers, and as far as I can tell, the woofers are different, but it could just be variation due to uh, impedance sweep or anything like that. But yeah, definitely different speakers, for sure. It's not the same model rebadged or rebranded or anything like that. It's 100% different designs. For my listening test, what I did was I started with the speakers at about two and a half feet off the wall. So there was two and a half feet between the wall and the back of the speaker. I pointed the speakers directly at me initially, and then I did play around with toe off, toe off, toe out and toe in 
Uh, what I found was pointing these speakers directly at you yield the best response because the top end on these kind of want to roll off a little bit as well. Now, other speakers, maybe they have a little bit of a lifted top end and towing them out will allow you to still have good, good overall high frequency extension, but it allows you the ability to make them look maybe like they fit better in the rooms. So I, I get that sometimes when you point a speaker directly at you, maybe it doesn't look as good, but in this case, I think the best result that you're going to get is by towing these speakers inward and pointing them directly at you. The bass on these extends quite low, definitely gets into the kick drum area. So for me personally, I want a speaker that's going to get down to 50 hertz. And if it doesn't do that, then I'm probably not going to consider buying it myself unless I know that I'm going to use a subwoofer. And with the floor standing speaker, I've often found that sometimes they don't get, they don't get that low, unfortunately. But these have an F3 somewhere of around 50 hertz with an F10 of around, I think, 30 hertz. And we'll see that in the data in a little bit. The overall sound of these, to me, is just a touch bright without any equalization. And I've talked to, I'd say, probably 20 different people since coming back from Axpona who listened to these speakers in that demo room, and they all said they liked them. There was one person who said that he didn't. And then there were a couple of people that said they thought they were a bit bright as well. And in my listening, I found that to be the case. Looking at the data, it's pretty obvious what's going on is that there's some extra radiation from the tweeter that is hitting the sidewalls, coming back to you in the listening position, reinforcing that four to seven kilohertz region and making it sound a little bit tipped up through there. Now you can fix that extremely easily with just one band of EQ, which is what I did in my listening. I set it to about 4,400 hertz, dropped it down by about two decibels with a Q of about one and kind of smoothed that right out, got a more pleasing sound overall. However, if you want a more neutral sound, which is what I'm after, then you can also use absorption panels on the side. And I'll talk more about that when we get to the data in a little bit. Overall though, I would say that it's not a breaking point for me. You know, like I think when you're factoring in everything that you get, the bass, the mostly neutral speaker sound, and especially the looks for $2,000 per pair, I genuinely am not sure that it can be beat at this price. Like I said, I expected that it would cost quite a bit more just based on looks alone. And I think that has been the general reception from the people that I've talked to who saw and heard them at Expona as well. The soundstage radiation, nice and wide, about plus or minus 70 degrees, very good continuity. Again, until you get up to about four to seven kilohertz where there's extra radiation from that tweeter. But that does give me a nice, good sense of spread, I guess, overall. And the soundstage and the imaging is nice and tightly focused as well but I did notice that it tends to lose a little bit of clarity in that lower treble region. Now, that could be one of two things. Maybe it could be response matching between the pair. The other factor could also simply be that the wider radiation creates more reflections and creates a more diffuse sound in that lower treble area. But again, I'm looking at this as a whole package and thinking, what am I getting in terms of sound and looks? I'm okay with that imaging precision being lost a little bit through that region. And if I EQ that down a little bit, it takes the edge off, brings that brightness down a little bit and makes the speaker a very neutral and pleasing sound overall. How a speaker sounds is directly related to how much subjective time I need to take to talk about it. If it's a good sounding speaker overall, doesn't take a lot of time. If it's a crap sounding speaker, then I can just sit there and point out all the things that are wrong with it. And with that said, there's not a lot for me to talk about in terms of subjective sound because there's only really one little point of contention that I had, and that was with the lower treble region, which I've already mentioned. So let's go ahead and start looking at some of the data, and I'll point out a couple things that might help you to improve your overall listening experience if you are interested in buying these speakers. All the data that you're about to see is captured using my Clipple Near Field Scanner, which is a state-of-the-art robotic device. I didn't measure it in somebody's backyard. I actually measured this with an anechoic measurement device tool and it gives us anechoic results. It allows us to see all the little anomalies going on with the speaker, the ones you can't hear and the ones that you definitely can. But part of my effort in my reviews is to explain to you the ones that you can hear and the ones that you probably can't hear. So let's go ahead and go. Starting off with the impedance. This is a pretty easy to drive speaker at a nominal load of about four ohm. The minimum impedance dips down to about 3.8 ohm. Now in my measurements, what I found was that the best listening axis was actually above the tweeter about two inches or so. Initially, I measured these speakers at the tweeter level, 
But then I played around in the software, which is great. The Clipple software allows me to say, all right, well, let's change the reference point to above the tweeter. Or if I wanted to, I could change the reference point to behind the speaker. When you're done capturing all the individual measurements, you can change that reference point to whatever you want. And in doing so, I was able to determine that if you actually put the reference point above that tweeter by about two inches, you have a more linear on-axis response. Sensitivity is about 86.5 decibels on average. The linearity is within about two and a quarter decibels. Like that's really impressive. Uh, most speakers that are of the tower flavor that look like this are not going to measure this well on axis. And, and honest to goodness, based on the looks and based on this graphic alone, I would say I expect that speaker to cost probably four to five thousand dollars per pair. So I'm, I'm actually genuinely surprised that they measure as good as they do. There are some resonances, though. As I said before, you've got one around 500 hertz. The F3 is at about 50 hertz and the F10 is at 32 hertz. So getting a good kick drum bass out of these tower speakers without having to use a subwoofer is possible. But if you want really low, low notes, you're still going to need a subwoofer. I think most of you probably understand that, though. This is the CEA 2034 data set. Same thing that we just saw a minute ago in black and green right here. But now let's look at the early reflections directivity indices. Now, whenever this becomes nonlinear, so if this were a straight line all the way up, that would be it's that would mean that it's linear. Whenever it becomes nonlinear and takes a deviation, that's an area that is going to be a little bit harder to equalize faithfully. Now, you can't just equalize the direct sound and not alter the reflected sound or vice versa. So when I talked about doing equalization to knock down that four to seven kilohertz peak, that is also taking away from the linearity of the direct on sound response or on axis response. And I would caution people to understand this. If you are in a very large room with practically no sidewalls, you're pretty much only going to hear the direct sound. If you are in a smaller room where the sidewalls are closer to the speakers, then you're going to hear a lot of reflected sound and direct sound. You're going to hear that mixture. And basically, the smaller that room gets, the more reflected sound you hear. The larger that room gets, the more direct sound you hear. So when we talk about how can we address anomalies in speaker response? Well, first of all, we have to say, does it bother us? So that four to seven kilohertz issue in my room stood out. And I understand why it's because the reflections off the sidewall. If you have a room that is larger, and in this particular case, the sidewalls are about three to four feet away from the speaker. But if you have sidewalls that are much further away, then you might not get as much reflection in those particular frequency ranges as I do in my room. Or if you have furnishings like a couch or you have drapes or something like that that can help scatter those frequencies or maybe even absorb those frequencies, then it's going to be less bright or less edgy, if you will, than it was in my listening room. So what I did was I just EQ'd that area down, understanding that I'm also EQing the direct sound, but that was the, that was the trade-off I was willing to accept. This is the estimated in-room response at zero degrees and 30 degrees. And this is just a quick drawing of zero degrees being pointed directly at the listener, 30 degrees being pointed away from the listener. This line represents how I heard the speaker in my room. And as usual, what I find is that this estimated in-room response aligns very well with how I heard the speaker. So if I draw the line as a trend line going through the mid range and then keep going in that direction, well, relative to the mid range, the high frequency sounds a bit bumped up by about three decibels or so. That can cause this speaker to sound a bit sharp. What did I say? Bright and edgy. If you don't like that, you have some options. You can either use EQ to bring this particular area down, which is what I did, a Q of about one, uh, about negative two dB and set at 4,400 Hertz did the trick for me. It was just fine after that. And this gives us a quick idea of the before and after effect. So this is before, and this would be after using equalization. And here's the equalization parameters that I used. Actually it's 4,400 Hertz, negative two and a half decibels, a Q of one, if you wanted to emulate what I've done. The alternative is to use acoustic absorption on the sidewalls. Now, the thing about acoustic absorption is that you might absorb frequencies that you don't want to absorb. Let's say that this speaker radiates very uniformly from low to high frequency. And unlike most speakers that tend to narrow in higher frequency, what would happen with a speaker like that is that you would absorb high frequency as well. And maybe you don't want to. But this particular speaker 
does behave like most speakers do, where as you get to the higher frequencies, that tweeter is going to start beaming. A dome tweeter placed in a flat baffle usually beams around eight kilohertz or so. And to give you an idea of what I mean, here's a quick sample, okay? This is a bird's eye view. From 200 hertz to 20 kilohertz, the red area is the highest energy. So we can see if we follow this through the upper mid range, you're at about plus or minus 65 degrees or so. But when you get above the upper mid range and go into the lower treble, that energy expands out to about plus or minus 80 degrees. And then as you get to, what is this, about eight kilohertz, that's where the dome tweeter starts to beam. And that's where the radiation narrows up and you lose more high frequency energy and it's directed more toward the front of the speaker. So my proposal to you is that if you don't want to use equalization, you could use acoustic absorption, that's tough to say, at the sidewall points where this energy is radiated, which is what I'm showing you right here at about 60 to 70 degrees, somewhere in that region. If you can go 60 to 80 degrees from that speaker relative to your listening position, then you can capture that excess energy and bring that in-seat treble down some if you have maybe a room that is more reflective or the sidewalls are a little bit closer than maybe a room that's much larger with basically no sidewalls. That's just an option for you to think about. Vertically, where do you need to sit? Well, you can put your ears on level with the tweeter or a couple inches below that or maybe an inch or so below that tweeter. But I wouldn't go too far above or below maybe that tweeter axis. As I said earlier, I found the best location was actually probably at the top of the cabinet. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels, 96 decibels. Both of these look good below 1% THD to about 100 hertz. And then when you get to about 70 hertz or so, then you start crossing that 3% THD barrier. Multitone distortion also looks good. You are exceeding this 3% distortion threshold that I personally like to just draw on a line because it gives me a point of reference. Doesn't mean that you're going to hear it. Sometimes those things stand out to me. Other times those things don't stand out to me. If you use a subwoofer and let's say you put the crossover at 80 hertz, does it lower the mid-range distortion? Yes. But then going back up full band, it doesn't lower it a lot. This indicates to me that the drive units are of good quality because if the distortion came down a lot by setting the crossover limit to about 80 hertz, then that would indicate that the distortion is really determined by the excursion of the woofers. And in this case, there's really not a lot of change here. So the drive units are at least a good quality in regards to their capabilities. Response linearity or dynamic range looks good. You have a good solid 20 decibels of dynamic range. But if you use this with a subwoofer crossed over at about maybe 60, 70 hertz or so, then you're going to have a good bit more of dynamic range. So just keep that in mind. And that does it for this review. Uh, again, I want to emphasize that Morel loaned me these speakers for review and I'm sending them back out. And I do want to thank them for having the balls basically to send out a speaker like this. A lot of manufacturers won't even return my emails. They had no problem sending this to me. And that's pretty dang cool. And I hope that you all appreciate when companies are, are willing to do that. I mean, I think it kind of goes without saying the implications that are there when they're not willing to do that. I also do want to mention that these speakers do come with feet, but there are not through holes the bottom of it. So I didn't have to worry about putting those feet in. I didn't have to worry about any kind of Mach 1 air velocities flying out the sink or AKA sonic booms occurring in my living room. And that's a really good thing. <laughs> oh, me. If you enjoy what I'm doing here and you want to support the channel, man, I would appreciate that. You can do so one of two ways, either joining me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. And that's a good way for me to talk with, with you all directly. You can ask me questions. You get some insider info, you'll get sneak peeks at reviews, you get pictures of what I'm currently doing, those sort of things. Another way, if you just, you know, if you use Amazon or you use Crutchfield or Best Buy or Target or any of these other main manufacturers, manufacturers, retailers, when you purchase through them, I have some affiliate links in my description. If you don't mind, just click in one of those generic affiliate links, go into whatever website's page and then ordering whatever. Most of the time that will allow me to earn a small commission off of whatever it is that you order. And it doesn't matter if it's speakers or anything related to audio video, it goes for anything, literally. So if you buy some new deodorant or shampoo, it goes toward that. And every little bit does help. And I certainly appreciate that. And I also appreciate you watching for this long. I hope you learned something. And if you have any questions for me, please feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them as soon as I can. I will talk to you later. Take care. Peace.